Hi, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Simply from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to edition 61 of the Food Safety Fridays programme. It's 2017, a new uh, programme lined up. Uh, we're back with, uh, I think, uh, almost 30 webinars this year. Uh, our first one today is with a new speaker, Kim Onnett from uh, NSF International. Kim's the Technical Manager Training and Education Services, Global Food Division NSF International. And Kim's going to be talking with us today about FDA's sanitary transport rule, uh, specifically who it applies to and the impact on food trans on the food transportation industry. So we'll uh, head over to Kim in a few minutes. But first, as you know, uh, these webinars are sponsored, come to you free of charge every week, uh, a short educational blast. And that's uh, obviously the, our kind uh, presenters, knowledgeable presenters, but also our sponsors who are, uh, kindly sponsored the uh, programme for 2017, Safe Food 360, Trace Analytics, Metal Toledo, and our new sponsor, AIB International. So thanks very much uh, to the sponsors. Um, just to say, it, it's being recorded today. It's live streaming and obviously live streaming relies on my internet connection, Kim's internet connection, and obviously the strength of your internet connections all over the world. So uh, I'm sure it won't go completely smoothly for everyone, uh, but we'll do our best. Um, the other thing is, we will send a follow-up email shortly after with the recording and the slides and the certificate of attendance. So if you do get called away, I know a lot of you are dialing in from your offices and things like that. If you do get called away to uh, uh, anything, uh, don't worry about it. You can always catch up on the recording. So um, I think that's it for now. I'm really pleased to be back. It's really great. I've missed it. Um, it seems like a long time. But uh, so, okay. Uh, Hello, Kim. Are you with us? I am. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, have you seen all the, all the um, attendees in the sidebar? Yes, I have. It's fantastic. <laughs> it really is international, isn't it? They're all from all over the world. It's fantastic. Um, and where are you dialing in from today, Kim? I am in uh, Canada, Ontario. Ontario, Guelph, yep. Canada. And uh, Is it sunny there today or not? Uh, no. No. <laughs> they have it, it, the weather uh, uh, forecast promises sun for Saturday and Sunday, and I'm depending on that. <laughs> right. Well, let's hope it shines for you. Okay, I, I'll just tell the audience about next week's webinar, and uh, I'll be back shortly, Kim. Uh, okay, next week we will have another news presenter, and that is Dr. Joanne Taylor, uh, Training and Research Director from TSI. And um, Dr. Joanne Taylor will be talking to us about culture. What is culture excellence? And it's a huge topic. You know, uh, members of the discussion forum, it, it's always coming up on the forums. It's now becoming uh, in standards. Uh, it's starting to be adopted into uh, food GFSI standards and things like that. Uh, and everybody struggles with it. But what exactly is culture? Can you, can you, define it can you can you measure it can you see it can you feel it uh, we'll find out next week um, with dr joanne so i've loaded it in the sidebar you can actually if you click the register now button in the sidebar it'll open a new window and you can do that without leaving the actual webinar if not don't worry you know we send emails and we will uh, follow up with an email and you can just register through the email okay you know the you know the score uh, okay, if you could get your slides ready now, uh, Kim, I mm -hmm. think we're ready for your presentation. Uh, I'll be back la later on, ladies and gents, uh, for the Q&A. Perfect. Can everyone see that? Can you see that? I can, yeah. That's perfect. perfect. Okay, well, yes, um, as Simon said, I'm, my name is Kim Onet, and I am the Technical Manager for Training for NSF in the, the U.S., and it's my pleasure to talk about uh, the sanitary transport rule go through uh, some a uh, brief description of FISMA and um, and the drivers for that, and then how the sanitary transport rule is designed, what the intent is, and then what it will look like for uh, real world application. Um, 
I have a background in both auditing and training. So I've done 12 years of audit, spent 12 years auditing. So I've seen certainly uh, operations uh, for transport uh, from both the storage and distribution side and then within plants. So it will be interesting to see how this this uh, rule uh, goes as we move forward. So just a brief description of NSF. If you're not familiar with us, we are a global player uh, and a leader in public health and safety we have developed over 90 national consensus standards. Um, most folks know of us from um, our restaurant and um, food safety equipment, from dishwashers to mixers um, to equipment like that. Most folks open their dishwasher at home and you can see the NSF, um, NSF uh, seal there. So uh, we have a public health uh, mandate uh, worldwide and and it's our commitment to helping folks live safer. Uh, through that, uh, not only the standards, like I mentioned, we offer certifications to those standards. In the Global Food Division, we have auditing and training and a sustainability division and a large group that certifies um, organizations to the ISO standards. And we're located around the globe. So for those of you located around the world, we are probably where you are. So as a quick run through on the agenda, we'll, like I said, we'll talk about FISMA a little bit, the background, some of those key themes and the concept and the drivers. We'll get into the sanitary transport rule um, and then what enforcement will look like. And quite honestly, what I have together for enforcement is what we've heard so far. Um, when we look at implementation dates for this, you'll, we'll see it's, it's not gonna be until April of this year. So, you know, we don't have any background to go on yet as to, uh, as far as what we think FDA is, how they will uh, apply this, so. Okay. So we have a poll question here. Um, what percentage of recalls are caused by failure in implementation of prerequisite programs? Okay, I've uh, loaded the poll in the sidebar. Uh, what percentage of recalls are caused by failure of prerequisite programs? What uh, everyone thinks. Yes, yeah, <laughs> 65, 50, 88 or 75 percent. And I think it's settling down at around 44%, uh, I'd say an 88%, and then it's sort of even Stevens between 75 and 65%. Mm. So how's that, Kim? Are, is, are they right? Are we right? 88% uh, uh, is actually the number. So 88%, uh, so we were close. I mean, people were in the ballpark. It's um, the failure of implementation of prerequisite programs uh, really was something that the FDA saw, heard loud and clear. And when they looked at FISMA and looked at what they could do to make food safer, they weren't concerned with HACCP. They wanted HACCP. They didn't think that, you know, it wasn't like they felt that HACCP didn't work but they realized there were all these other food safety risks, uh, contamination um, after the uh, post-process contamination, uh, poor execution of the cold chain. You know, they felt like there were other things that plants needed to be focused on in order to produce safe food. So they could have just stated, you know, and pulled the general food uh, manufacturing population into uh, a HACCP regulation like they did with seafood, like they did with juice, but they felt they could do more. And that started to drive some of the decision making. So the burden of foodborne illness in the U.S. is large. Uh, if you look at these statistics, uh, it can boil down to five or six people per day dying from foodborne illness, and the FDA knew we could do these things better. They knew we knew the best practices and how do we get those practices put in place um, more consistently. And then we had the globalization of our food supply. 
increase in imports. We have complex supply chains coming from, uh, you know, pro food coming from outside the U.S., coming, stopping at a port, getting on a truck, going to a drop site, going to a just-in-time warehouse, moving on to maybe the raw material plant. Um, it, you know, there were a lot of, of additional steps there. And then we have the influence of the media. So if a recall happens, you're going to see it on your Facebook feed. You may see it in your Twitter feed. And, and those things influenced a bigger action uh, from the FDA. So in 2011, as everyone has seen, we have the Food Safety Modernization Act that was passed. It was the biggest change to regulations in 73 years gave the FDA new powers, and the intent was public health protection, a preventive approach rather than a reactive approach. And that has, and we've seen that woven through all of the uh, seven rules that uh, became foundational to this preventive uh, approach. So we have the preventive controls for human food, those for animal food, produce safety, safety, foreign supplier verification, the accreditation of third-party certification, which will dovetail with foreign supplier verification, intentional adulteration, and the sanitary transport of human and animal food uh, rule, which we will talk about today. And this rule covers product that is transported by ground and rail. Uh, it does not apply to air and sea. But as soon as that product does hit U.S. soil, if that product is going to be sold and consumed in the U.S., then the transport and the management of cold chain and the management of that load um, would, will apply, will be part of this. Um, the bulk of the focus is on carriers. They are the parties supplying the equipment, the vehicles, uh, and, and doing that transport activity. And the rule does look at unloading and preloading and some pre-cooling, but the, um, the gap that they felt uh, was out there was this while the product's over the road. How are we making sure the load uh, shows up where it's supposed to be in safe condition? Import safety mandates continue to drive this because of the global food supply. And it was really a paradigm shift to prevention, again, that prevention um, uh, prevention versus reaction. So now we're watching what's coming in. Uh, voluntary qualified importer program, uh, that's like TSA pre-check for products coming in from uh, outside the US, uh, and that's a completely voluntary program. But again, as soon as that product hits the US um, and is transported uh, rail or road, this um, rule is going to apply. So I've loaded another poll question in, um, but we could, depending on how this can be managed, uh, we can just, folks can just type answers, I guess. So to get an idea of who's on in the group, which of these activities apply to your operation? Are you just loading and shipping product out? Uh, are, do you just contract transport? Because there will be a role for you um, in this regulation if that's your job or that's your business. Uh, transport only or receiving raw ingredients and shipping finished goods kind of from a um, the, the general manufacturing. Okay, without prompts, without me. prompting, the audience have uh, already just started typing Wonderful. the letters. So uh, excellent. Yeah, let's see. So lots uh, of receiving and shipping, you know, manufacturers, but some were all because I know a lot of manufacturers will contract out their transport, so they have folks on site that would be doing that. Hmm. Um, and if you own your own tr trucks, then you're transporting or. Yes, yeah, some of them are okay. all, all. Some of them are saying all, all A, B, C, so, D. Yeah. yeah, so a good, so a good range, which is great, because the rule the rule is touching everyone here. But, so yeah, so at, at least we can see that it relates to a a, a lot of the audience. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Okay, so let's jump into uh, the sanitary transport rule. Um, implementation of this rule, rule is really going to better establish a back and forth between the shipper and receiver and put some requirements in the middle around the carriers. So the intent was to regulate the sanitary transport of human and animal foods, and it's built on a rule that's already there, uh, the sanitary Food Transportation Act of 2005. Most of the practices that are in place in manufacturing facilities that I've seen in 12 years of auditing are really based on that and that Transportation Act. But their goal was to prevent unsafe practices that create food safety risks. Again, that prevention uh, action more than, than reaction. And what they saw was issues with temperature abuse, potential cross-contamination due to inadequate cleaning, and then of course the biosecurity of products. And this will apply to those outside of the United States um, because of international freight. And if an importer arranges for the transfer of an intact container once it hits U.S. port and goes onto a motor or rail vehicle, it's going to U.S. commerce and, and there uh, the rule will be applied there. The foods subject to the rule will be those transported in bulk or packaged. So bulk would be juice, animal feed by rail or tanker, and any of those products that we ship by uh, tank or truck tanker. Uh, packaged foods that are not fully enclosed in a container, so fresh produce. And then those packaged foods that require temperature control for safety. FDA has stated that they will be uh, granting waivers, and these will focus on the grade A milk safety program. So shippers, carriers, and receivers who are permitted, permitted already and inspected under the NCIMS grade A milk safety program will get a waiver because they already have regulations that require um, uh, safety of that product and control of that product during transport. Uh, and then those products that are under the FDA retail food program and state, tribal, uh, territorial, local enforcement and FDA oversight folks, they, they will be looking at that as part of the uh, 2013 FDA retail food program. So if you're shipping from, if you're a retailer and you're shipping from your local warehouse into your retail stores, that's gonna be covered there. There are exemptions to this rule. Uh, and if you feel that you uh, that an exemption applies to you, please double check that, do the research, make sure you have evidence uh, to uh, explain your position uh, if, if the FDA were to visit. So shippers, receivers, or carriers with less than $500,000 in average annual revenue. Uh, I recently did a presentation for transport brokers and all of them said they thought that they would meet this because they might do 500,000 in food. They broker lots of transportation, but they actually, when they looked at it, they, they were not exempt. So I'll have an opportunity to work with them again because uh, they want information since they did not meet the exemption. Uh, transportation activities performed by a farm. Shipments through the United States to another country. So if someone's shipping a product from Canada, they're driving through the U.S. and dropping that food in Mexico, it will not apply to them. Uh, transportation of food that's imported for future export. So it's here. It's not going to be consumed here. It's not going to be distributed here, but it ships from here to another international location. Transportation of compressed food gases. Transportation of human food byproducts. Uh, that are transported for use as animal food, uh, transportation of food that's completely enclosed by a container except a food that requires temperature control for safety. So that's um, repeated again there. And then I know someone asked about live animals, uh, transportation of live food animals except molluscan shellfish. And obviously molluscan shellfish are um, would be covered um, because they're not going for slaughter, they're going for consumption. Um, so I know someone had a question about that. So yes, does not apply to live food animals. Okay, 
So the requirements really focus on, on four main areas, the equipment, the operation, training, and records. So there are expectations in the rule around how the equipment is designed, maintained and equipped to ensure food transport. So most of us that have seen shipping and receiving, these are the same things that you're going to see in a, in a shipping um, uh, in, in a shipping or a loading uh, SOP around good condition and um, uh, refrigeration functioning, clean, uh, no damage to the trailer where it's going to damage food. And then temperature control uh, procedures around making sure you're not shipping raw and ready to eat products, potential allergen cross contamination chemicals, things that we're pretty familiar with. Uh, then sanitary practices, being awareness, uh, having uh, awareness of food safety hazards and transport, making sure folks are getting training. Uh, so for carriers, this may be a new training concept. Um, and this is driven by the contract, and I'll talk about that in, in, the, in the next couple slides. And then records. So records will need to show that Carriers have information on the very on the specifics of shipping specification and cleaning procedures, temperature records, and again, of course, keeping those training records. So the roles are defined by the regulation. They've defined these terms. So uh, the shipper arranges for the transportation of food in the United States by a carrier or a multiple carrier sequentially. And a loader is defined as uh, someone who loads food onto a motor or rail vehicle during transportation operations. Uh, a carrier physically moves food by rail or motor vehicle in, the com in commerce within the United States. And then the receiver is defined as someone who receives food at a point in the United States after transportation, whether or not that person represents the final report point of receipt for the food. So there may be multiple receiving um, locations. So how is this going to be implemented in industry? We're pretty familiar with those roles if we're, and, and most of you said you were doing all those activities and have these procedures in place. How would you show evidence of that? What types of records are you, you going to need to be thinking about? So the contract is, is kind of the line in the sand. So contracts between the shipper and the carrier will determine the duties and responsibilities. And when the shipper determines temperature control is necessary, then the contract must tell the carrier what the requirements are for pre-cooling, how those temperatures on route will be monitored or how the load temperature would be maintained. They need to have records to provide evidence that the product's been the safety of the product's been maintained during transport, and those must be maintained. So we will uh, talk about how long uh, those records must be retained and how they're um, how they'll be looking at that. Under the sanitary uh, transport rule, uh, when any person covered person or company at any point in the transport supply chain becomes aware of possible failure of temperature control or another condition that can render the food unsanitary or adulterated, that food must not be sold or distributed. So this is talk, this is referencing and, and talking about having a way of communicating to the owner of that product or the receiver of that product, hey, we've had an issue, this product needs to be evaluated before it's sold. So uh, kind of like what we know as hold, uh, I don't think they're intending it's going to go as far as the uh, reportable food registry, um, but certainly there may be circumstances where where that would be uh, where that decision would be made. But it's a matter of stopping, having a conversation, securing that product if it has been become unsafe over the road. So. As we look at responsibilities and operations and the way this, uh, the way the responsibilities are laid out in the regulation, it comes down to 
responsibilities of those individual roles, shipper, loader, carrier, and receiver. And then there's a requirement of written procedures and the requirement of training. So I've laid out a table here um, with some general requirements. The global, uh, global Cold Chain Alliance has done an excellent job putting together um, the documentation uh, and suggestions in documentation, uh, and you can get that from their website. Um, but as we look at this, it's very logical and, and very linear. So the shipper would pro provide a specification on the requirements of shipping. And in order to execute on those specifications for shipping, they would need to have written procedures around how they maintain their equipment or how the carrier maintains their equipment, what their expectations are, temperature controls, cleaning and sanitation, prior cargoes, and what happens in breakdown, um, and then training as appropriate. What would the shipper need to train their folks responsible for uh, these activities and, and understanding those SOPs. The loader executes on the written procedures. And certainly, as we've seen in industry now, trailer condition, temperature requirements, these are very common things that loaders are trained on. Carriers are newer to this. Um, they have not really been required to show proof of training. As of now, we haven't heard too much about uh, an over-the-road truck driver being asked if he's been trained in food safety and does he have any evidence, but that is going to change. So the carrier must meet the specification and must communicate when there's loss of control. And they would have SOPs around their operations that would, again, echo some of the shippers with equipment maintenance, temp controls, their cleaning and sanitation practices, uh, prior cargo in tankers. Those of you familiar with tanker transportation, um, uh, wash tickets and procedures around cleaning that tanker between types of product that you haul will be very important. Obviously, the carriers need training in safe food handling, food safety hazards, breakdown procedures, why a, a temperature, uh, a cold chain breakdown is important and what that means to the food. Uh, and then the receivers are really in a verification role, right? They're verifying the condition of the load, the temperature of the trailer, the trailer condition, and they're communicating that back up the chain when it's, when it's inadequate. Um, they would have procedures around evaluation of goods, procedures around evaluating those trailers, and any reject or hold actions. And again, their training would be as appropriate based on what role they play as a receiver. So I know there have been some, I've just glanced quickly at the chat box, I know there have been some questions about training. So again, when the carrier and their shipper have agreed in written contract that the carrier is responsible in whole or in part for the sanitary conditions during transport operations, then training is required. And that training will focus on sanitary conditions, breakdown procedures, food hazards, temperature controls, and actions on unsafe products. Again, the driver for this entire rule is that we need to protect public health when the product is traveling over the road. And previously that was a gap, they closed that gap with this rule. The frequency of training has been defined that it must be provided upon hire and as needed thereafter. And those of you who are um, responsible for training at your sites, you're aware of this, that training doesn't happen just once. Uh, you may do an initial training, but as things change, as issues are brought up uh, or, or procedures are changed, then training, retraining may need to happen. Um, and then carriers must establish and maintain those records that documented the training described uh, records must include the date of that training, the type of training, and the person trained. So if there's clear traceability of uh, how that, uh, what was covered, 
how the training was delivered and who uh, who attended. So when we look at records, the maintenance of those written procedures, the SOPs and the records generated by those, um, carriers and shippers will need to be maintaining these records. So equipment maintenance, cleaning and wash tickets, uh, prior cargoes, having evidence of prior cargo. Realistically, um, if a liquid bulk tanker over the road were uh, stopped and inspected, the logical questions will be, what was the last, uh, what was the last product you hauled? Show me there was cleaning between, and what what are you hauling now? Um, Temperature controls would, would obviously be a large piece of this because when temperature control is required and the contract states the transporters is responsible for that, we're jumping into these procedures and records and agreements. And then, of course, training documentation. Record retention is addressed in the rule. So carriers must retain records of their written procedures that are required for a period of 12 months. And those must be maintained beyond the agreement date, right? So if they have an agreement that expires with a company in January of 2016, they would still need to maintain those records in 2017. So for 12 months beyond that agreement date. And then carriers must retain training records for those people identified as conducting those activities for a period of 12 months beyond the that when that person stops performing that duty. Uh, these records can be stored off-site, uh, provided retrieval and availability is within 24 hours, which is in alignment with the other regulations uh, for human food, animal food. Um, and then written procedures must remain on-site. So you couldn't have your written procedure stored off-site or your SOP stored off-site with your records. Obviously, written procedures and SOPs on-site uh, makes logical sense and is a best practice because those people who are carrying out those procedures need to have access to them. And we see that in manufacturing. That's not anything um, that isn't already uh, done. So... What does the impact look like? How do we expect um, how do we expect this to work? As far as compliance schedules go, April 6th was the final rule publish date. And so as we traditionally see, a year from the final rule. So we're coming upon that April 6, 2017 this year. Smaller sites, uh, smaller locations, less than 500,000, um, they will be two years out. But I would think even the smaller suppliers may begin to see some of these requirements because all they, although they are a, small, uh, a smaller business, they're potentially transporting loads for larger companies that are already going to be having this in place. So they may uh, see some impact from this rule. FDA has stated that their enforcement resources uh, would be the Department of Transportation um, and, and some of the state personnel. So we may be seeing as early as April or end of April, some of the Department of Transportation doing some of their general checks. And if they have been trained, uh, they may be looking at the food safety piece. Again, hasn't been, hasn't kind of been go live yet. So we don't know exactly how that will play out. Uh, the FDA is developing training and technical assistance. So you could right now reach out to the technical assistance network and, and get information or, or get answers. Um, they will also be putting an online training together uh, for everyone to access um, so that there will be resources that way from a training perspective. 
And then there is already a guidance out at the FDA website, uh, and I have the link at the bottom of the slide. So there is some guidance in place. As far as exactly how will these inspections go and how will they be communicated, uh, that hasn't been clearly um, established yet um, because we haven't had any inspections against it yet. The idea of the sanitary transport food rule is, is not to just set up a few procedures, put them in place, and, and kind of leave them there. Uh, the intent is that, that it's going to be living and breathing like HACCP is. Um, so the expectation is there will be verification activities around this, and as changes need to happen in your programs based on your agreements with carriers, or with shippers that that um, it's it's a live and breathing program, and of course training has been a requirement uh, throughout all of these uh, rules um, because quite frankly knowledge is power, and once everyone understands what's required, implementation is much stronger. NSF offers training. Uh, we're currently offering the preventive controls for food and animal food. Uh, we'll be doing um, produce safety in this this year, sanitary transport this year. There will be a foreign supplier verification program that is now in um, uh, being tested. Uh, so we'll soon be offering that um, because our intent is to partner with industry to uh, help them uh, meet the requirements, and then we have our additional accredited training suite that uh, some folks are probably familiar with around HACCP and internal auditor, and uh, we have a very large expanded uh, training offering for the United States um, that's available on our website. Uh, we can uh, come to you and deliver on-site programs. There are public training programs. We are um, releasing a large e-learning platform this year. So uh, we can meet your needs. Uh, and then, of course, our consulting um, group and our auditing group are always there to help. So. so I thank everyone for listening. And I see there are a lot of questions. So I will uh, <laughs> yeah. stop uh, sharing now. Yes, if you can stop sharing now, Kim. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, very useful. My um, back overview there, <laughs> uh, and obviously there is a huge thirst for knowledge on this uh, subject. Um, I can tell you now. You know, I've I've, I've run sixty webinars, and I, I really haven't seen so many questions previously. So, uh, how long have you got, Kim? So, I, well, I, yeah, I do have a meeting at 11 o'clock East Coast time in the U.S., but I okay. have some time, and, and I may not have every answer, so I will certainly do the research and get back to everyone well, if I don't. Yeah, well, what we'll do, obviously, we, all of these questions are saved anyway, so we'll compile them at the end, we'll email them round, and we can follow up any that we miss. But uh, sure. between, between now and at the end of the webinar, I'm going to start from the bottom up. Um, sure. So, f first of all, Brian uh, asked, does this regulation apply to hauling of live animals such as cattle or hogs to the slaughterhouse? If not, right. if not, no. do you foresee that the FDA adding that aspect in the near future? Uh, it does not apply to them. I have not heard anything. Uh, we have, as an organization, have not heard that they look at that. Um, a lot of that is covered uh, by animal welfare uh, requirements. So I, I have not heard that they would be looking at that. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Timothy, can you give more detail on not fully packaged beside produce? Can you give any more examples? Right, right. I actually saw that question when it came up. The open produce is what we have traditionally seen from FDA as, as one of the examples of that. Um, fully packaged would traditionally has been described as in a box, totally sealed, in a bucket, totally sealed. Um, so I think if there are questions around that, maybe going to the technical assistance network or conducting your own risk assessment and taking a look at yeah. and 
and really honestly looking at could could this product get contaminated yeah okay uh sarap if you ship to and from farms are you exempted if you have exposed products Shipping. so farm yeah. farm activities were part of the exemption so if this is going from a farm to another farm or farm to packing house then our understanding is no okay charles um are all of our products that we ship are completely enclosed um, we are bottled water company. Am I exempt? Right. You are exempt because that bottled water would not require refrigeration unless for a quality stand from a quality standpoint, you possibly you know, you want to refrigerate that. I, I don't know. OK, uh, Mark is asking, um, can you just sort of expand on training records? What what would be required for training records? Right. Um, as far as for the carriers, what we envision and, and what we intend to roll out in 2017 for our training programs is issuing some type of card. So there is some type of card that the drivers can keep with them, just like they would keep a card uh, proving training on safety over the road, um, hazardous, um, uh, hazardous gases or hazardous materials hauling. Um, that's what we envision. Um, I think training records held at a main oper you know, a main transport office might also suffice. We're going to have to see what FDA is going to accept as they start looking at it. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Bruce, are restaurants that receive deliveries of food foods classified as receivers under FISMA? Hmm. Restaurants that receive deliveries of uh, foods. Those should be covered by the food code. Um, however, there are restaurant chains in the U.S., and I'm only speaking from my experience in the U.S., that have very detailed requirements for deliveries, for key drop deliveries to restaurants. So there may be, um, you may see internal programs and requirements um, that, that would be put on by your customer. Uh, your supplier customer. Okay. Um, Timothy is asking about contracts. What is considered adequate for a contract? Right. Uh, this is a great question, one that we've heard a couple times, and we have not seen uh, a solid answer around that right now. Uh, in some of the GFSI schemes, there uh, we were already talking about contracts and expectations around contracts. Um, we expect that this will roll into that, uh, maybe something a little more in depth than a bill of lading, um, because uh, depending on how a bill of lading is treated, you have the shipper sign and the, um, the carrier that's taking um, possession of that load over the road. They do sign a common agreement. Um, but from what we've understood from industry, that the bill of lading is not always as strong as a contract. Okay. Uh, Kathleen, um, we make a cookie that we ship okay. refrigerated, but temp control is not required for food safety, just quality of the product as it mm. contains chocolate. It contains chocolate. Does this rule yeah. apply? <laughs> uh, I think I would get confirmation on that. Again, it really is driven by food safety. However, if product is becoming rejected at the uh, at the receiver location, um, I'm not quite sure on that. Again, it, it really is a safety driver. Um, but I have heard in industry over and over many times how product is rejected for quality reasons. Mm. And um, I, I think uh, I think we'll see some of that grow. And these are best practices that are already being used. So. Sure. Uh, Dale is asking about food packaging. Are they exempt food packaging materials? Yes, food packaging yes, is are. not part of this. Now, uh, food packaging gets a little tricky because when in the foreign supplier verification program, food contact packaging is considered food. So if you're purchasing food, food, you're purchasing food contact packaging from outside the United States, you would still be required to conduct your risk assessment 
um, have your preventive controls in place, and there may be, and there probably would be, some uh, verification activities that you'd have to put in place for those foreign suppliers of packaging. Okay. Uh, Jeff is asking, how and where do transportation brokers fall into the program? They, they right, are right. acting as the liaison shipper. Right. They are considered a shipper. Brokers are, con shi are, are considered shippers and would need to put the requirements for shippers in place. And we've had a lot of requests from brokers to come in and do training to have conversations with them um, because they realize now they're arranging for transportation um, that's uh, for product going to be sold and consumed in the U.S. Okay. Uh, Kimberly, does each level need verification of the prior party's compliance within the rule? Uh, that is... Um, uh, Global Cold Chain Alliance has done a lot of work with that, and the expectation is we would have a logical, linear process where the shippers are sure that they've loaded a trailer in good condition, and then uh, carriers are agreeing. The receivers really are in a verification type rule uh, role uh, to be signing off that yes, the load was in good condition, trailers in good condition. Okay, good. Uh, Clarissa, what are forms of verification of temperature control on trailers, stroke trucks throughout the route, the route? Right. Route? Yep, throughout the route. And this has been something that's been talked about in the U.S. and in Canada, and I'm sure in other places, cold chain management uh, is the biggest challenge. Um, the rule talks about being able to show that that product was maintained in a safe condition throughout the route. So there are probably many ways to do that. Uh, the rule is not stating that there's going to be a temp tail on that trailer uh, throughout the entire route. Uh, I think those things will be worked out between in the contract between the shipper and the carrier. And they have not prescribed one way. We may see once the training comes out, once they've written their training, uh, to see what they are recommending. We haven't seen that yet. Okay, thanks, Kim. Uh, a bit of a long question this, uh, Kim. Oh, okay. <laughs> bear with me. Uh, this is from Anita. Is a manufacturer shipping foods and contracting a transport carrier to ship, is this, is this manufacturer now responsible to, responsible to obtain cleaning records from those carriers? We currently issue a letter of guarantee that covers one of the requirements being cleanliness. Would that be sufficient? Uh, that's that's a very interesting. Um, I I think I would like to take this question offline because I want to understand more exactly the role. I think that's a very good start. Again, it's evidence that um, uh, of your desire to comply with the regulation. So if that could be emailed to me, I would I would be happy to do an email uh, interaction with her. Yeah, will do. Yeah. No problem. Um, okay, G G L C is asking how long must training records and receiving records be kept? Um, so again, the records are one year from the time of that activity, right? One, so it's a right. year. Okay. So for training records for the carriers, a year beyond the last date that that person executes that or uh, does that job. Okay. Um, uh, Kathy, will FDA provide training material stroke format similar to PCQI? <clears throat> uh, I don't know that the format will be uh, similar to PCQI. I, I'm a lead instructor for that, uh, and it, that, that's a very long, um, uh, very solid two and a half day curriculum. I don't know that there's enough in this regulation that it would need to be that long. The intent is that this would be online. So I don't see it being exactly laid out like PCQI, but certainly their position of this is something that we recognize as adequate uh, if they're putting it up on their website and making it available, they, they, um, we, that would be similar because they recognize the PCQI. Okay, okay. Uh, another long one. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to get this. Uh, it's from Bria B. What, okay. what if any compliance to the sanitary transport rule is required of shipper who supplies, who supplies corn husk to a food processor? 
would there be any further mm. FISMA compliance necessary for the shipper and our manufacturing facility who have an agreement to store the shipper's product in our facility? Uh, that's a good one for email, <laughs> I think. I think, uh, yeah. Initially hearing it, corn husks and not needing refrigeration, I'm not, I, I'm not sure yeah. this would apply, but I, I'll, I'll definitely take that one in email yeah. if... if um, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit it's, <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing well, Kim, you're doing really well. well and, and this is a new, this is really new. I mean, we haven't had anything yeah. like this. So it, the questions are going to be uh, uh, plenty. Yeah. Okay, Eva, uh, what are the record requirements if you only use LTL carriers? Uh, LTL will still count. Like it, It's not like because it's an LTL, uh, this doesn't apply to only full shipments. Right. So there will have to be some form uh, of documentation, whether you use an LTL or a full truckload um, right. situation, which which oh. I know is a challenge for industry. I respect that. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, Ranjit, if a full sealed container of preserved vegetables bulk received, received in USA for further processing, does that fall under sanitary, the tra sanitary transport rule? So mm. se sealed container of sealed container vegetables. of sealed container of shelf stable product is that product uh, shelf stable uh, vegetables bulk received uh, preserved vegetables yeah so when I think of preserved vegetables I'm thinking of um, a shelf stable product like pickles or yeah. artichoke that's canned yeah, that's something coming like that. in to be to be processed on I don't know if if they don't require refrigeration, then that shipment over the road is is not going to uh, uh, apply. They would still expect um, CGMPs, right? You, you they're not, just because it doesn't apply around the temperature requirements doesn't mean you can load that on a filthy damaged truck. Yes, but sure. Yeah. Certainly, the deeper requirements of temperature control. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Casilda, will there be PCQI type training and will each company need to have one employed? No. Uh, they, so far, they have not said uh, that uh, someone must be specifically trained in this requirement and be on site. That is not part of the regulation and there hasn't been any uh, intuition around that. Again, they will put training on the FDA website. Okay. Uh, Kathleen, are we required to ensure our carriers are complying with this law? That is going to depend on the contract, but certainly as we look at um, the agreements between shipper and carrier and who's responsible, this puts a different slant on that agreement. And um, I think they're... they're will be more responsibility on the shipper to be sure they're using responsible carriers. And the, and the risk is you use a carrier that isn't trained, that doesn't have training records, and now your product's on a tractor trailer uh, being transported across the U.S. to be sold in the U.S. and uh, they get stopped, there's no training and then, uh, yeah. uh, or no proof of training and there may be some challenges. Okay. How do you want to put your brand at risk, I guess, is is a, is a what you'd be thinking about. Yeah, sure. Uh, Robert Bottle, uh, will truck way stations enforce this rule? It's possible, right? Because I believe that that's a DOT. So if the Department of Transportation is looking at way stations, it's possible. They have said they will leverage their DOT partners. So I think it's possible we will see that. Uh, Esperanza, Thomas, is there any particular rule or requirement for transportation of bottled wine or olive oil, I think, and olive oil? Mm -hmm. Again, um, pre-packaged non-refrigeration requiring products. So pre-packaged foods that don't require um, uh, refrigeration would be exempt. But again, if you're dealing with a large manufacturer who's got this process in place, that's that's not to that's that's not to say that they won't be asking for that because they're going to want to streamline their operation. But technically, as far as dealing with the FDA over the road, we wouldn't expect them to stop that type of a trailer. 
my guess is they will start looking at the most risk, uh, the highest risk product, and that would be um, those items that require refrigeration because that's the bulk of the rule. Okay. Uh, Kim, um, I don't see anything requiring trucks remain sealed while in transit mm -hmm. to ensure that no one tampers yep. with the goods. Uh, will that become a requirement, tamper evidence? Or? Yeah, no, that that is a requirement and uh, that is a great point that I didn't key on. But that will be part of intentional contamination, uh, intentional adulteration, which traditionally focuses on the plant. Um, but there is focus on security of the loads. That's 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 accurate. Okay. Uh, Timothy is a distrib distrib distributor delivering to retail grocery store required to meet the requirements. So, uh, right. It, the line in the sand is not as clear for that. If you work for, um, I'm trying to think of a very general retailer, Kroger, and you're going from Kroger's warehouse to Kroger's store, then that's covered on the, under the food rule. If you are a manufacturer transporting into a retailer like a Costco, a Walmart, into the Walmart warehouse, then this is going to apply to you. Okay, great. Uh, Laurie's asking, what was the link for the guidance? Obviously, that's that was a, on a slide in the presentation. The slides yep. will be issued uh, mm -hmm. after the webinar with the recording and the certificate, so you'll be able to pick up on that, yep. Laurie. It's very good. Very good guidance. Uh, da, 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 da. Timothy, I am hearing that in some cases, frozen, fully enclosed products may be exempt. Is this true? Uh, I have not heard that. Uh, certainly, that's temperature control for safety uh a, a product that would be shipped that way so I, I have not heard that okay i think um what we're approaching the hour now i know you've got to to go kim i think right. we've had we've <laughs> had our pound of flesh out of you today uh no problem got, fantastic um it's clear there are a lot of questions and yep. uh, it's clear that you uh, kim have a lot of answers and obviously nsf is a good resource to go to on this subject so uh, what we'll do is we'll collate all the questions, send them on to you, and then yep. we can, and we'll post them on the IFSQM website and follow up. So, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to follow up with anyone. Just let me know. Yeah, it's been your first uh, webinar with us today. Has it been okay? Yeah, it's been fun. Great. It's been well, great. Hopefully, I don't think you're scheduled again this year, but hopefully next year you'll you'll join <laughs> us again, and we'll hopefully this won't be the last time. Good, good, good. Yeah. All right. So th on behalf of myself, all the attendees today, uh, the IFSQN and everybody that sees this webinar recording yes, in the future. Thank you. thank you very much, Kim. Thank you. OK. Uh, right, ladies and gents, there's only uh, one more thing to do, and that's to uh, load your certificate, which is in the sidebar now. Uh, we've had a good crowd here today, a fantastic um interaction with everybody uh, sorry if we didn't get to your questions like i say we will follow up um next week we've got the um what is culture excellent uh, excellence uh, fantastic topic so thanks for your attendance today um we will follow up with the email afterwards so don't worry um it's friday happy friday best day of the week uh, enjoy your weekend and come back to work all refreshed next week uh, take care ladies and gents Bye.